So today, uh, again, we take up the next gate in the 108 gates of Dharma Illumination. We're at gate 77, right action. Uh, so you'll recall we have moved into a section of this text which is talking about the Eightfold Path as factors of awakening. So the eight elements of the Eightfold Path as factors of awakening. So today we're on the fourth one. Uh, our gate statement says, Right action is a gate of Dharma illumination, for with it there is no karma and no retribution. So first let's talk about what karma is about in this Soto Zen tradition. Uh, then we can look at what we mean by retribution, and then we can connect all of that with right action. So the word karma just means action. Uh, and because of all the teachings that surround the word and surround the term, it's taken on a particular set of connotations or a particular set of meanings. And of course, in popular culture, it has a whole other kind of layer, <laughs> right? Uh, but it simply means action. So in early India and in the Vedic tradition, you know, actions from the past influenced the present, and karma kind of worked in a straight line. So when Buddhism comes along, it's a little bit different. Things get a little more complicated. Karma is more complex. It's not so directly linear. There are multiple things influencing the action of this moment, and there is some measure of free will that gets mixed into this thing, and it becomes not quite such a straight, direct, linear thing. So the image that gets used for this is flowing water. So sometimes the current of the flowing water is very strong, and all we can do is kind of hang on, <laughs> right? for dear life. At other times, that flow is more gentle and there's some chance to divert that water or to influence where it goes, to reroute it in some way. So this kind of shift turns karma from something that's kind of depressing, like there's no escape from my suffering because you know my circumstances inevitably lead to some disaster for me or some pain or some suffering for me. Turns that into something which is a little more encouraging. We can pay attention to what we're thinking and saying and doing, right? The three places we create karma. We can pay some attention to that and we can take some skillful action or some wholesome action that at least doesn't create more suffering. We can't change what's already, what we've already done, but at least we can pay some attention to how are we moving forward from here? Uh, how are we creating or not creating additional suffering? So, in fact, Uchiyamaroshi says, in Japanese, we have expressions such as go no fukai ningen, a person with deep karma, or, or go tsukubari, a person whose karma is very strong. These expressions refer to those with extreme condition viewpoints, partly as a result of intensive life experiences. Buddhism is often misunderstood as a teaching of resignation that makes me think, I can't help it, it's my karma. Such a Teaching cannot be true Buddhism. Instead, Buddhism teaches us to soften our rigid karmic standpoint, deconstruct the illusory views of the karmic self, and see life as it is. So he says, you know, we have some chance to, to make a difference, to do something else. So, you know, early Indian belief is that there is an unchanging soul or entity called Atman. We've heard about Atman. Uh, this is something that transmigrates through various conditions, life after life after life, being pulled by good or bad karma. So the Atman was a sort of a fixed self, which in itself was pure, but was sort of imprisoned in the body. And the body was the source of desire and delusion and, you know, the hindrances and all of that. So somehow there was a pure something which is encased in this flesh. Uh, which is the source of problems or the source of pain. So the Atman served as the sort of owner of this body or the driver of this body, um, the way you might drive a car, right? So the body and mind dies, the Atman or the owner kind of leaves the body, transmigrates, is born with a new body and mind. So the circumstances of being reborn are dependent on the good and bad deeds that the, that the owner, the person, has, uh, that, that the person has done, and the resulting karma from that. So Buddhism, however, of course we know, teaches that there is no fixed permanent self. There is no Atman, no soul, um, you know, nothing that is sort of fixed and unchanging. There's only the five skandhas. There's only the five aggregates of this body and mind. And those five skandhas are themselves empty of any permanent fixed self nature. So there's nothing we can cling to about this and say this thing is, you know, permanent. This thing goes on and on. But that doesn't negate cause and effect. And this is kind of a problem for us. This is a thorny problem that's never sort of been resolved. Uh, there is still cause and effect, in some cases even beyond this lifetime. 
So we do things in this life, for instance, that continue to have some effect even after we're not here anymore. Uh, we put certain things in motion. Uh, you know, people have memories of their encounters with us or things we did, um, sometimes many years after we're gone. You know, my mother died more than 20 years ago, and I'm still doing things today that she taught me to do. So in that way, right, that's all still kind of unfolding. Uh, or, you know, at some point, and I had an ancestor that got on the boat in Greece and came to this country, and I'm here because of that. So in some way, you know, this is still unfolding. So we each get to decide kind of where we stand on the whole rebirth thing. We can decide it's literal or we can decide it's not. <laughs> we get to maybe have a, an opinion or have a choice about that. In the West, it's not generally part of the assumptions of our culture that somehow we get reborn in a new body and mind. Um, but, you know, Dogen says we should chant the refuges continuously between the time we die and the time we're reborn, which in this tradition is 49 days. Right, seven weeks, 49 days, seven by seven. So bodhisattvas are said to practice life after life after life because of the vow to save living beings. So if there's no Atman, if there's no fixed permanent self, there's nothing that hangs around, what is it that's chanting for 49 days? <laughs> we don't know. So it's an unresolved point. It's been around since the beginning of the tradition. We're not going to answer that one today. So we can all decide where we come down on that. Um, but there's some, some question there. But folks have been talking about that for a long time. Anyway, what determines whether we are creating good karma or bad karma is our motivation. It's our intention behind the action that we're taking. Uh, so Buddha identified four kinds of karma. He says there's karma that's dark with a dark result. There's karma that's bright with a bright result. There's karma that's dark and bright with a dark and bright result. And there's karma that's neither dark nor bright and has neither a dark nor bright result. And that one is the ending of karma. So dark means something painful, something unwholesome, right? Something that's creating suffering. Bright means something which is pleasant and wholesome and does not create suffering. So karma that is neither dark nor light results in, it said, taking up the Eightfold Path. So if we have neither dark nor light, Somehow, uh, we are pulled toward, directed toward, taking up the Eightfold Path. So this kind of karma that's dark and bright with a dark and bright result is a reminder that even when we try to do good, we try to take the right action, somehow, sometimes, suffering still results. So it's not completely dark, completely bright. There's something in the middle. We have some good intention and yet perhaps some suffering results. Sometimes we make mistakes. Or we actually intended to maybe like do something that wasn't so wholesome, and yet something wholesome comes out of it. Right? So we've got this mixture, dark and bright. I would venture to guess that's where 98% of our action falls, right? <laughs> it's very difficult to take some action that doesn't have some little piece of self-interest in it or, or some little piece of delusion in it, right? So, Hojo-san says, intentionally or not, we may create unwholesome karma even when doing good. We must carefully examine our motivations. Identifying twisted karma is easier when we take unwholesome actions that disturb others than when we're trying to help. Even if we fail to recognize our bad behavior at the time, other people will let us know through their advice, blame, anger, or dislike. But when we create twisted karma with our good deeds, people are usually happy and praise us, and we in turn are proud of our actions. In these cases, perceiving the deep and subtle self-centeredness within our benevolence can be very difficult. This is why our practice of zazen as repentance is significant. In zazen, we cannot hide from ourselves. As the Kanfugen Bosatsu Gyoho Kyo says, if you wish to make repentance, sit upright and be mindful of the true reality. So there's always this little bit of mixture, right? Uh, you know, giving is a wonderful thing. Offering is a great thing to do. Helping people who need things when we have something that somebody needs that we can give, that's a wonderful thing to do. Of course, if we're doing it in order to get something back, we're looking for praise or reward or love or good publicity or whatever, good self-image. Uh, of course, it can actually generate bad karma. So we've started out with some wonderful motivation to give something to help somebody, and yet there's this little bit of clinging in there that can create some unwholesomeness in the midst of that action. So, you know, we can be cultivating pride and arrogance and attachment rather than loving kindness and generosity. It doesn't mean we don't take a good action, you know, as soon as we notice that little bit of self-centeredness, it doesn't mean we don't 
make the offering. Doesn't mean we don't give, but we have to be aware of where we're clinging and where we're stuck, right? Because there's no, <laughs> probably no pure, pure action. So there are three things, you know, as I just mentioned, uh, that we use, if you will, to create karma. That's our body, speech, and mind. So there's physical karma, there's verbal karma, and there's mental karma. So bad physical karma means killing, stealing, misusing sex. Bad verbal karma means lying, divisive speech, harsh speech, idle chatter. We've talked about that here before because we've talked about speech several times uh, because of these gates. Bad mental karma is all about the three poisons, greed, anger, and ignorance. So there are you know, 10 kinds of unskillful action. Those 10 things that I've just mentioned, 10 kinds of unskillful action. Uh, they create suffering for other people as well as for ourselves. Cause and result, you know, we do something, there's a result. We take some action, there's a result for ourselves or for other beings. So that's an important teaching in our tradition. There are also, of course, 10 kinds of skillful actions, which are the opposite of those 10 unwholesome things. Um, or, or the resolution not to engage in those 10 unwholesome things is also a skillful action. You know, every time we retake bodhisattva vows, every time we see kind of what we're feeling pulled toward and we say, you know, that's not a wholesome thing. I'm not going to do it. That in itself is, is good action, right action. So again, right action is a gate of Dharma illumination for with it, there is no karma and no retribution. So we take right action or skillful action. We avoid creating bad, harmful karma that feels painful, feels unsatisfactory. Um, we do that now, and at the same time, we're setting up causes and conditions for something in the future. So we're taking good action now, choosing not to cause suffering now, and the impact of that goes beyond here and now. We're setting up some causes and conditions for things that continue to unfold. So one way we reinforce our intention or our motivation is with our bodhisattva vows, whether we do that sort of publicly. Um, you know, we participate in Jukai or we receive a Raksu or something like that, or we just kind of do that privately. We have some private resolution or resolve or intention to live according to Bodhisattva vows. Um, you know, when we live by vow, we stop living by karma. We hear that in this family and in this tradition. There's living by vow and there's living by karma. So our motivation becomes the well-being of everyone doesn't leave this one out, but it's, you know, something which goes beyond my personal private self-interest. Now motivation and intention is about the well-being of other beings, including our, all beings, including ourselves. Mm -hmm. So we're not just all about taking care of the desires of small self mm -hmm. and all the things that kind of go with that. So Uchiyamaroshi says, most people live by their desires or karma. They go through their lives dragged around by desires and hindered by the consequences of previous harmful actions. In Japanese, that kind of life is called gosho no bompu. Gosho are the obstructions to practicing the way caused by our evil actions in the past. Bompu simply means ordinary human being, that is, one who lives by karma. Our actions are dictated by our karma. We are born into this world with our desires and may live our whole lives just reacting or responding to them. And that feels pretty day to day, right? <laughs> like we're just, we could, when we pay attention, we notice we're constantly being pulled by things we like, things we don't like, chasing after stuff, running away from stuff. It's just this constant, constant, constant thing. So um, he goes on to say that the contrast to that is the way of life of a bodhisattva who lives by vow. Gansho no bosatsu, right? Living by, uh, bodhisattva living by vow. And again, his or her focus, the focus of the bodhisattva is on liberating all beings from suffering. So it shifts a bit from only just what I need to how do I live in such a way that I liberate myself and all beings from suffering? So we can't act in the past, we can't act in the future, uh, now is all we've got. So once we've taken some kind of action, we can't undo it, we can't go back and not do it, we can't change the creation of that karma, for good or ill, <laughs> right? We can't do anything about that. We can only really see what's happening, do repentance, renew the vow to give up unskillful action, and cultivate skillful action going forward from here. So we're still responsible for what happened, but we can't change it. Um, the outcome of those activities, we've set something in motion, something unfolds, we did it, we can't undo it. Um, I might see that that thing I did yesterday or last week or last year 
uh, was unskillful, but whatever results are coming from that, kind of still mine. Um, even though, you know, now I wish I hadn't done it, now I see that it was the cause for suffering. Um, so it's important to head off unskillful action to the degree we can before we take it, because we can't undo it. So paying attention is important. Um, the result of that action can color the way that we see the world in subtle ways. Even though I know that wasn't the idea, somehow I took this action and, and I'm uh, affecting the way I see things going forward. So Sawaki Roshi says, Gokan, or seeing according to one's karma, is one's good or bad past actions extending into the present. For example, a widow who has lived her whole life obsessed with sex might be jealous of young couples. Ordinary human beings are pulled by their karma and view the world only according to their karmic conditions. Such people continue undesirable yet unseverable relations with each other one lifetime after another. This is called perpetual wandering within samsara. So in the early teachings, engaging in unwholesome actions was said to create karma that was eventually going to send you to one of the hell realms <laughs> on the wheel of samsara, right? Uh, so Aki Roshi says we get hypnotized by ourselves. That's his phrase. We get hypnotized by ourselves, which means we just sort of follow our habituated thinking, right? Our karmic thinking uh, without asking what we're doing or why we're doing it or where those impulses are coming from. We just sort of get carried along on that stream of... Uh, being influenced by what's unfolding. So when we pay attention to what we're doing, we might realize, you know, I'm doing something that I kind of think maybe I don't want to do anymore. Or I have this habit of reacting a certain way or saying a certain thing or seeing in a certain way. You know, maybe that's not actually helpful. But of course, until we step back and pay attention to what's happening, it's like that's just our habit. It's our habituated thinking. We're just going to ride along on that. Perhaps we are perpetuating suffering. So, you know, we get to step back and look at what we're doing and, and make some decision about what we're doing. So Dogen's comment on right action as a factor of awakening uh, is really too long to read in its entirety. You know that I've also, in addition to looking at the gates, been looking at the uh, Dogen's fascicle on the 37 factors of awakening because sometimes he makes a direct comment. So in this case, you know, he does make direct comments about the... Um, Eight, uh, the, the Eightfold Path as a Factor of Awakening. So he does have a comment on right action. It's very long. I'm not going to read you the whole thing. Um, in no small part because it's mostly a long rant. <laughs> he kind of goes on a tear uh, about quote-unquote Zen masters who pander to kings and rich people and sort of laity in general by saying that it's possible to receive the truth of Buddha Dharma without leaving home and becoming a monk. So his point is, you must leave home and become a monk, otherwise it's no good. So we'll talk about that, <laughs> right? But he goes on this long tear about people who do this. So he thinks these Zen masters are trying to gain some kind of favor or material wealth that they don't have any real interest in helping people to practice or in sharing the Dharma. So he's saying there's some measure of self-interest. It looks like wonderful Dharmic activity. You know, they're going out and, and you know, talking to people about the Dharma. But he says these folks have some measure of self-interest. It's not actually 100% wholesome right action uh, because there's some suspect motivation there. So he's attacking these folks because, you know, to him, to Dogen, right action starts with leaving home. And he says the 37 factors awakening are the actions of a monk, whatever that means. So he says... Right action as a branch of the path is to leave family life and to practice the truth. It is to go into the mountains and to gain experience. Shakyamuni, Buddhis, Shakyamuni Buddha says the 37 elements are the actions of a monk. The actions of a monk are beyond the great vehicle and beyond the small vehicle. There are Buddha monks, Bodhisattva monks, Shravaka monks, and so on. None has succeeded to the right action of the Buddha Dharma, and none has received the authentic transmission of the great truth of the Buddha Dharma without leaving family life. So he goes on to use the examples of Bodhidharma and Shakyamuni as practitioners who couldn't have done what they did for the Dharma without leaving home. Uh, you know, Bodhidharma is said to have left India and gone to China to transmit the Dharma. Shakyamuni left his family, you know, went over the wall, declined to take up the, you know, sort of uh, the throne from his father because he was a, uh, a ruler to just decline to rule the kingdom after his father. Not because kingship isn't important, Dogen says, but because he simply wanted to devote himself to the Dharma. 
So the main point of his comment is that being a home lever is itself right action, and all the activities that flow from being a home lever are also right action. And he says that once someone truly encounters the Dharma, then he or she immediately wants to leave family life and simply take up practice and only engage in that. So he concludes in his comment, right action is the action of a monk. It is beyond the knowledge of commentary teachers and sutra teachers. The action of a monk means effort inside the cloud hall prostrations inside the Buddha hall, washing the face inside the washroom, and so on. It means joining hands and bowing, burning incense and boiling water. This is right action. It is not only to replace a tail with a head, it is to replace a head with a head. It is to replace the mind with the mind, it is to replace Buddha with Buddha, and it is to replace the truth with the truth. This is just right action as a branch of the path. If appreciation of the Buddha Dharma is faulty, the eyebrows and whiskers fall down and out, and the face falls apart. Okay, <laughs> so before we all give up our practice, because we're not living in a temple, um, and because we have lives outside of San Shin, uh, we need to remember that Dogen doesn't actually take this same position consistently throughout his writing. So either he changes his mind over time, or he adjusts what he's saying depending on the audience. So um, sometimes he says being a monk is the only option. Sometimes he validates lay practice or practice outside of the temple. So I think we need to be careful not to be too literal about this. I don't think he's telling us if we don't live in a temple, we shouldn't be practicing. So please don't take that to heart. Right? I don't, want to, I don't want to see the Zendo empty now because everyone thinks Dogen says we shouldn't be here. I don't think that's what's going on. Um, I think he's saying right action is simply carrying out the daily activities, if you're in the temple, the daily activities of the temple, or just taking care of our practice, taking care of our daily lives, taking care of the things we vow to do in whatever context we're vowing to do those. So doing zazen, doing liturgy, taking care of our bodies, doing our work tasks, whatever it is that makes up our bodhisattva action in the world, simply taking care of that, he says, is right action. So, in other words, right action to him is just sincerely, wholeheartedly doing our practice moment by moment by moment, seeing the way Buddha sees moment by moment by moment. So remembering our vows, remembering our commitments, doing our best to carry them out with compassion and wisdom and clarity. So then he says, it is not only to replace a tail with a head, it is to replace a head with a head. So what does he mean by that? So right action is not about just replacing attention to kind of broader spiritual concerns with attention to everyday activities. He says we have to see those everyday activities as spiritual practice, right? We have to see all of our activities as Dharma gates. Uh, as a way to both study the Dharma and to express Buddha nature. So every little thing we do, all of our day-to-day -day responsibilities, if we're in the temple, if we're not in the temple, all those things are Dharma gates. So how do we see our everyday walking the dog, paying the bills, washing the dishes, doing our work in the office, whatever, how do we see those things as practice? And if we do, all of those things become right action. If we come to them with that spirit, with that intention, all of those things become right action. He says, it is to replace the mind with the mind, it is to replace Buddha with Buddha, it is, and it is to replace the truth with the truth. So a real bodhisattva is someone who practices and cultivates right action for the sake of practice and right action, not because we're going to get something back. So this bodhisattva is not replacing bad karma with good karma for a selfish end, right? I'm not going to do right things in order to fix my bad karma so that I feel better. Um, action is happening because it's in the best interest of all beings, whatever that action is. So I'm replacing, if you will, replacing bad karma with good karma, not so that I get something back, but so that all uh, beings have well-being, including this one. So it's not just about me. If appreciation of the Buddha Dharma is faulty, the eyebrows and whiskers fall down and out and the face falls apart. Well, you may have actually encountered that image um, in other texts, if you're reading around. He doesn't make this one up. Eyebrows or whiskers falling out is often an image of somebody speaking inappropriately about the Dharma, um, receiving a kind of spiritual retribution 
And now we're back to the gate with the retribution, right? So someone who speaks inappropriately about the Dharma, whether intentionally or out of ignorance or just something, someone's doing something inappropriate. Often the problem is a teacher speaking too much. <laughs> Explaining too much or saying too much about the Dharma is, a, is supposed to be, if you do it, you know, like wrong, is inappropriate. And then supposedly the whiskers and the eyebrows fall out and the face falls apart. So <laughs> you can decide whether that's what's happening here or not, right? We have to be careful about what we say and, and you know, not talking too much or explaining too much. So in any event, in this context, we can just say someone who doesn't understand right action, doesn't understand the Buddha Dharma, is doing something unskillful, incurring some kind of unpleasant <clears throat> karma, some kind of spiritual retribution. Okay, so again, right action is a gate of Dharma illumination, for with it there is no karma and no retribution. So, don't speak inappropriately about the Dharma, <laughs> and you can keep your whiskers and eyebrows. So, our teachers tell us that in Zazen we don't create karma. So, we're just, you know, sitting there in complete thusness. We're not making any decisions, we're not doing anything, we're simply dropping off body and mind, sitting there. Emptiness, right? So, not taking any action that's motivated by three poisonous mind, or by the opposite of three poisonous mind. We're simply sitting, and yet we know thoughts keep coming up. Um, those thoughts are based on our karma. Something is continuing to unfold, even though our intention is we're going to sit here quietly. We got stuff on our minds because we encounter things in the world. We encounter causes and conditions. We're living in these karmic bodies and minds. We're going through our daily activities in this samsaric world. Um, so, we think about stuff. We've got stuff on our minds. Even though we might not be creating new karma in Zazen, our old karma is continuing to play out. So, you know, I had that conversation last week with somebody, it's on my mind. Or I, there's something I have to do next week, it's on my mind. So, right? We have cause, karmic causes and conditions. The karmic consciousness is still going on. Thoughts are still happening. They're not coming from nowhere. Uh, they're coming from what's going on in our lives. So just as, you know, Shakyamuni was awakened under the Bodhi tree, he didn't, like, poof, disappear, right? He still had karma to play out. He had to live the rest of his life because his karma was still playing out. So our challenge in Zazen is not to keep getting pulled back into our karma by grabbing those thoughts, adding something in there, you know, creating a cocktail. You know, we just, we want to get sucked back in. It's so easy, right, to get sucked back into what's on our minds when we're sitting our zazen. We can't stop thinking in zazen, and we don't want to stop thinking in our zazen. It's not possible. It's not a goal. The goal is not to be dead. Um, you know, but if we're chasing stuff, we're running away from stuff, you know, chasing our thoughts, running after them, we're not really engaged in zazen. We're mostly just caught up in this karmic consciousness that, that keeps sort of letting these thoughts bubble up. So our practice is to hold both of these things, right? Freedom from attachment and delusion, and still practicing, taking right action, with this body and mind, which is all we have to use. This karmic body and mind is the ground of practice, right? This is all we've got to take our bodhisattva action in the world, to take right action with. So somehow we get to balance these two things. Freedom from attachment, freedom from delusion, and yet we're existing in this karmic circumstance. So we've got form and emptiness. Or as Hojasan says, we have manifestation and liberation. So we're manifesting something, and yet there's liberation. There's form and emptiness. There's all of this happening at the same time. So we're in this body and mind, but we're free from this body and mind in a certain kind of a way. This is a karmically created body and mind. We're moving through a karmic world. And yet, if we're not attached, if we're seeing clearly, we're free from this body and mind. We drop off body and mind. So Hojo-san says, viewing things with the true Dharma eye and viewing things with our karmic consciousness are very different. As bodhisattvas, we need to see things with the true Dharma eye. Still, we are not completely free from our karmic consciousness. We have to live out our karma. Precisely speaking, our karmic condition is the only device we can use to practice. If this is our attitude toward our daily lives and in our zazen, we can let go of our karma and be liberated from our attachment to it. We need both manifestation and liberation as our life. So we're not grabbing one and running away from the other. We need, you know, both of these things are here. We can't avoid them or, or run away from them. So how do we embrace both of them? 
in a skillful way. When we get up off the cushion, as we will do at some point today, and go out of the zendo, um, we do stuff. We gotta go out and do stuff. We have to make choices. We have to you know, determine what actions to take as we just move through the world in a normal everyday way. So those choices are based on our values and experiences and our worldviews and all of that, which is an unfolding of our karma. So even when we are really, really trying to take good action, uh, take right action, be skillful in the world for the sake of the Dharma, every choice is a continuation of that past karma and it sets up new karma. So there's this continuous kind of unfolding all the time. The choices we make, the worldview we have, the perceptions we have is influenced by the things that, have, that, that we're carrying around, the things that have happened already. And based on that, we make a choice which sets up something which continues to unfold. So that's not a bad thing. It's the way life is. It's the way this karmically conditioned body and mind work. It's just you know how our lives unfold. We can't float around not making choices, living on some kind of higher plane, <laughs> right? Which is why when we're talking about replacing a head with a head or a tail with a head, you know, we can't just kind of live up here. We have to take some actions. We can't avoid taking actions. It's, it's not responsible and in some cases it's dangerous. We better know that's a red light or a green one. <laughs> we better know this food is spoiled and this food is wholesome, right? We have to make choices. We have to do that. Um, we just need to remember that our actions are influenced by our karma. And this is how we sort of create our lives, moment by moment by moment. So can we avoid being in the thrall of past unwholesome stuff we've done, recognize what happened, take responsibility for what happened? Now, what's the right action of this moment? Even as I'm influenced by and sort of carried forward by the things of the past, like what do I do now? Because I can take some action in this moment. I can recognize the influence. I don't have to get stuck there and I don't have to get sort of carried along by that. If I'm really paying attention, I'm watching my habituated thinking. I'm watching my sort of reflexes and my impulses and saying, you know, I have a choice now. So in this moment, which is the only time and place I can act, right here and now, what am I gonna do? So I'm giving Hojus on the last word today. He says, our practice in daily life is about creating wholesome karma. In this context, wholesome karma means to manifest in daily life what we experience in Zazen. No separation between myself and other people and myriad things. That is how the Buddha is expressed in everyday activities. With all the choices we have to make, we try to make these choices in the direction of the Bodhisattva path. That is our life based on Zazen and the Bodhisattva vows. So, I don't have a clock. I'm assuming we've got a little time. Uh, what would you all like to say about right action and the influences of the past and how it unfolds in the future and whatever is bubbling in your karmic consciousness today? And uh, Dojo, I'm going to ask you to call on people remotely because I can't see them, so maybe you'd help facilitate that. Yeah, I'm going to switch the mic over. Okay. Can everyone hear us over there? Yeah. Good. Okay. All right, what would folks like to say this morning if you have something you'd like to say? Sawyer, please. There's a, um, a section of the Zuimonti, Shobogenzo Zuimonti, that we read a few weeks ago after morning, morning service that's been kind of ringing with me. Um, that relates very much to what we're talking about. And it is kind of a poignant little story of there's a monk in Dogen's, you know, temple who has a sick mother. And so he asks Dogen, like, so in order to take care of my sick mother, I'm having to sort of interact with people outside of the temple and make sure that arrangements are made so that she's cared for. But there's this tension that he feels because he can't totally devote himself to the Dharma uh, in the temple. And so Dogen's advice is, you know, he says, you know, this is a hard situation. He has some compassion for it, but he ultimately says, set things up with your mother so that she's going to be okay 
and then leave and then sort of let let her go and fully um, enter into the way and so I'm wondering how that resonates with all of us as sort of non monks basically um, do is our practice basically to take care of our sick mother <laughs> um, you know as in a metaphorical way and is that different from fully entering into the dharma or not <clears throat> i think today in the modern west we would well i can't say we would, i can't speak for it but many people would argue taking care of sick mom is entirely practice because i've been there um when my mother was terminally ill uh, i was still in minnesota at the time we were in the middle of ongo uh, I had any number, I was not ordained then, I was a lay person, uh, but I had any number of responsibilities there because I was an office, a practice officer and a board officer. So, um, you know, I wasn't doing quote unquote monk work, but I had plenty of felt responsibilities to the temple. Uh, and when my mother got sick, I pretty much just said, folks, you're not going to see me until she dies. Because I felt like my, the, mm, more powerful dharmic responsibility at that point was to take care of her because I knew there were other people that could manage the temple and she didn't have anybody else. I was the only one still in town with her. So it felt important to me to say, I'm going to take care of my mother, but I very intentionally did that as a practice. I said to folks, this is my ongo is taking care of my terminally ill mother. And I did nothing else. I mean, I went to work as long as I could go to work, you know, but I really did nothing else. Uh, and I really took it as a practice. So I just said, you know, in a Bodhisattva context, what needs to happen here? So I very consciously said, I'm not going to worry about, I, you know, I'm going to like pay my mortgage, but I'm not going to worry about kind of taking care of some parts of my own life I'm going to put on hold in order to do this for as long as she's here. And that was a pretty intensive practice, I got to say. I might as well have been living in a temple <laughs> for the intensity of that. So that was a kind of an extreme example, I think, of how you can uh, live your practice very intensively outside of a temple, you know, outside of becoming clergy or doing all of that. Uh, so when I, and I know that story, I, I remember that story, you know. Uh, I think for us today, we would look at that and say, well, you know, that's kind of extreme. You're going to abandon your mother <laughs> when she's ill in order to carry out your, your, responsibilities in the temple. I think we would look at it differently in the modern West. And I think each of us has to <clears throat> kind of weigh that circumstance, you know, for ourselves. Um, if there are other people who can take care of mom and you can share that responsibility, maybe you can. If you if there aren't other people to take care of mom, you can fully enter into that as a practice. And it might not be mom, it might not, you know it might be your cat. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, it could be any kind of being that, that needs help. So where is our time and attention as Bodhisattvas best put? Where is the need the greatest? <clears throat> Mom might be the greatest need. Um, so, you know, those stories are, are helpful in making us take a step back and think about what we're doing. But again, I think we can't take them as absolute and as literal. And as this is the only one true answer, um, you know, wisdom and compassion go together. And I also think we have to recognize, as I say, you know, he Dogen shifted his thinking during the course of things. If somebody had asked him that question at some other point in his life, maybe he would have said something else. I don't know. I don't know. So I think we have to be careful about rigidity, right? That's a tough situation. Uh, so, yeah, I, I don't think we ought to be abandoning our mothers. <laughs> um, you know, even, even if we're wearing this stuff, I think we need to not be abandoning our mothers. We have to be careful, I think. You want to follow up on anything there? Yeah, I guess I was just also sort of thinking of it metaphorically a little bit, too, in, in that taking care of our sick mothers that, you know, when the Buddha says the, the world is on fire, basically, um, mm -hmm. and there's all of this suffering around, mm -hmm. that's that feels like you know the whole world is our sick mother mm -hmm. in a sense. Sure. And so it almost feels like the, and this may <clears throat> be a misunderstanding, but it 
an instinct would say that the Mahayana perspective is the, the Maha, Mahayana action would be almost to not go away to the temple and to stick with the sick mother, mm. in whatever that sick mother is, mm. you know, in, mm. in the world. Um, and that feels resonant at least to what we're doing. But I'm, almost, I'm wondering what is a bodhisattva in a temple, basically, versus mm. a bodhisattva who is not in a temple? Mm -hmm. Which is a really good question. Um, you know, in our tradition, when we spend time in a training temple, the expectation is we are not there forever. It is not a matter of entering into a cloister and never coming out. So, you know, what we call a training temple, San Juan Soto, you know, in the West, people look at that and so say, that's a monastery. Sometimes I ask people, how many sodas and monasteries do you think there are in Japan? And they give up a lot of numbers, and I go, zero. Because the idea is you go in there to train as clergy and then you go back in the world. You chances are you're going to take over the family temple. <laughs> yeah. For some people going in, they don't have a family temple, their families do something else, like Hodrasan, you know, and they decided to take this path. Um, you know, for many people, they're there for the regulation amount of time and then they're going back out to take care of the temple to take care of the family temple, which is nothing other than taking care of the congregation, taking care of the Dhaka, right? Uh, so it isn't about going into the temple and never coming out. It's very much about how do we <clears throat> learn to be bodhisattvas in the world? How do we learn to practice and share the Dharma uh, and do the things that our lay congregants need us to do? Um, so the world on fire is very much the sick mother. I think you're absolutely right. So I think each of us gets to decide, and especially in the West, when we have so many options about how do we carry out vows, you know, for some people, um, looking like this, taking these vows means, you know, you're a Dharma teacher in a temple and your main job is run the temple and make it possible for the Sangha to practice. But for other people, you're working in a hospice or you are doing social justice work or you are you know, teaching in some other venue or you're a chaplain or you're doing palliative care or a myriad other ways, right? Um, and, you know, for some folks, you build buildings <laughs> or you do whatever, you know, you're a classroom teacher or you do whatever your job is. And you do that from the perspective of being a bodhisattva. So your priority in your job stops being, I'm going to climb the corporate ladder in order to get something. And it starts being, how do I do this job as a bodhisattva in the world? How do I save the world on fire with this action that I'm taking with this work that I'm doing? So I work for the government. I spent my secular career in government and nonprofit. So I was, before I did this full time, 16 years working for the government. And I very much took my practice to work. I made a very conscious choice to say, you know, when I'm in my office, how do I appropriately bring my practice to work? I'm not out there evangelizing everyone should sit zazen, you know. But how do I take that zazen mind into the work that I'm doing? and provide in, in some way some refuge for people. It was very interesting. When I took my practice to work, people started coming to my office and sitting down and telling me their stories. And you know, they just wanted someone to help figure out their interpersonal stuff. I was a communications person. I mean, I wasn't doing like HR, you know, but there was something about, I felt like if in the midst of this swirling stuff, you know, in an office, <clears throat> where we were concerned with wastewater and transportation and airports and, you know, land use planning and all of that. It's like, how can that be Bodhisattva work? Well, it could be, you know? So I think whatever it is that we're offering through our work, I mean, it's an offering. I don't care what we do for a living, run a cash register, walk dogs, I don't care, it's an offering. So how do we do that for a world on fire, you know? We don't have to look like this and we don't have to take public vows, but just like moment by moment by moment by moment, what are we doing for the world on fire? How are we being Kanzeo? How are we hearing the cries of the world or seeing the cries of the world? Because um, we can't ignore it. So even if we think our work is drudgery, even if we don't like the situation we're in, it's like there's some little measure of encouragement, I think, that says when I go to work in the morning, how is this bodhisattva activity? How is this right action? How is this skillful action? 
we can look at that moment by moment, like, you know, what I'm about to say, the thing I'm about to do. And we can also look at it broadly and say, well, I'm, I'm in this job, so like, how do I make that practice? How do I make that Bodhisattva activity? And not about me. So it's an interesting question, isn't it? Like, we all need to think about that. <laughs> I don't think it's the same answer for everybody. You know, um, the sick mother, the world on fire doesn't go away. So in the midst of that, in the midst of, I mean, I own a home. I have cats at home. I, my yard needs to be raked. I mean, <laughs> you know, I don't live here. Uh, I, I, I deal with it myself, too. I think we all do. What would others like to say? Let me stop talking. I see lots of hands up. Uh, shut on and then... I and then I should go. Hoku, you use the word consciousness. Yeah. And then you qualify that word with another adjective karmic consciousness. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are various views and discussions, uh, opinions on this word consciousness. Yes, don't get stuck. In, in, in different, we don't need to go there. <laughs> what, what I would like to uh, understand is what is Dogen's perspective and Soto Zen's perspective uh, on the word consciousness. Mm. You also use the word spiritual. Mm. And that's another aspect I would like to understand that as well. Mm. Brief mm. discussion mm. on that. So in this context, the term karmic consciousness, actually um, I'm using it in this way, the way Hodosan uses that term, which is to see in a way which is influenced by our unfolding karma, right? So our worldview, our perceptions, our opinions, our values are all shaped by these seeds that get planted, by the things that we sort of encounter. Um, and it sets something in motion. So I'm using it, so without getting into a lot of technicality about that, because that kind of wasn't where I was going with it, I'm using it the way Hodasan uses it, which simply means how, you know, we see based on our karma. So I was born in this country, so I see things in a particular way. My friend who was born in Japan sees things a particular way, right? So, so I'm going to be just very simple about that. That's all I mean by that, uh, how we see based on karma. Uh, so when I said something about spiritual matters as opposed to day to day, um, I, I was intentionally making a separation so that I could bring it back together. So when I'm talking about the broader things, you know, um, it's easy for us sometimes to, to think that, well, uh, in order to practice well, I have to only be concerned with emptiness rather than form. So I think the point of making the time was, yes, there's, you know, the world of emptiness. <laughs> um, you know, there's what's going on sort of broadly in my world of awakening or you know, what, I, what I think awakening is. And then there's the day-to-day -day tasks about taking out the cat litter. <laughs> and we think, well, that's tainted stuff. We're dealing with money, this tainted stuff. Somehow cleaning is very spiritual. <laughs> but when it comes to sweeping up after the cat, you know, that doesn't feel like something which is so spiritual. So how do we see all of those things as quote-unquote spiritual activities? Or I guess a better way to say that for me would be, how do we see all of those things as practice? How do we see all of those things as manifesting our Buddha nature or as Bodhisattva activity? Mm -hmm. um, so that those are not activities which I do in order to get something for myself. I take out the cat litter so that my house doesn't smell bad. <laughs> but I also take out the cat litter because that's what this moment needs me to do. You know, <laughs> that's, what, that, that's something good for everybody if I take out the cat litter. Right? So it becomes a bodhisattva practice because it's not only about me. I'm setting aside, gee, I'd rather be watching a movie right now. I'm saying, well, you know, there's something else that needs to happen. Right? So I'm using those things in kind of non-technical ways, and I hope I'm not creating confusion by that. Is that enough about that for now? I think I, that's, that's fair. I just want to understand the context in which you are using Yes, yes. I because typically, that's a very broad, broad absolutely. I mean, you, you can't put your arms around that. I agree. And I typically don't uh, use a word like spiritual. I would tend to say practice, you know. There is one more observation. It's not a question. Uh, you opened up the uh, discussion Talking about different religions, having born in India, I'm exposed to all this in a very 
phenomenal depth, as I say. But what caught my attention is is the is the root, uh, whether it be the the Mahayana or the other one, uh, and the all the offshoots. Obviously, Soto Zen flourished in Japan. When I look at Tibetan Buddhism, I do see they promote the concept of reincarnation, mm -hmm. especially if not for the lay people, for their leaderships, for mm -hmm. their head monks and so on and so forth. So there is that inherent element, and I'm confident that, uh, that uh, Soto Zen, when developed by Dogen, promoted in Japan, saw the shortcomings of that and wanted us to uh, wanted us to focus primarily on on such practice. I don't know what's your opinion on that. Well, I mean, Dogen talks about we have to you know do things life after life, or we have, and so does, you know, so you so you hear phrases like life after life. So I think we can all take from that what is helpful to our practice. I think in the modern West, when we think about things like reincarnation. Um, we tend rather to use a word like rebirth because it allows us to think about moment by moment by moment what is unfolding. So moment by moment by moment we are transmigrating through the six realms of samsara. You know, I do something which perpetuates suffering and, you know, I may suffer too and now I'm in hell realm and then I'm driven by, by desires and I'm in an animal realm and then someone I love says something wonderful to me and I'm in heaven realm and I'm going around and around and around, you know, driven by that kind of thing. So moment by moment, you know, <laughs> where on that wheel are we reborn? Um, so, you know, we can decide if it's literal or not, but I think uh, the helpful teaching for us is to recognize that um, in, in, in this life of impermanence, we're going around and around, that we have some ability to affect where we are on that wheel, <laughs> right? If we're taking wholesome action, perhaps we're not getting sent into the Avicii hell, <laughs> right? We have some, so, you know, um, life after life, what does that mean? I kind of think we can think about that moment by moment, life after life. Like, you know, what does that mean? So, early teachers don't necessarily negate that idea. Um, you know, there were so many questions that Buddha just didn't answer. He would say, I know the answer to this or that, but I'm just not going to talk about that because I'm here to teach about suffering and the, and the ending of suffering, and that's all I'm doing. <laughs> so in some ways, we don't know. I mean, I don't know what will happen after I die, and I could spend a lot of time worrying about that and thinking about that, and it may or may not be helpful. Uh, and also, what am I doing in this moment? Right? One, yeah, one of the, and again, I'm going to stop off to this. One of the... Um, Again, in the context of consciousness, um, one of the uh, discussions that I came across uh, in from the academic side, um, when you mentioned the word moment by moment by moment, uh, is, the, is the awareness, the consciousness of that moment. So Buddhism, Propagated, yes, consciousness which is transient and which is on a moment by moment by moment basis. And our awareness of that depends upon our alertness, which we practice through samadhi, as they say, for that specific moment itself, so that we are not disillusioned. And after that, Buddha became quiet too. You know, he said, "Let's stop that." You know. So I appreciate you sharing your thoughts. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Well, you know, impermanence, right? So even you, our thoughts change, our our opinions change, our viewpoints can change. Uh, let's not get <clears throat> let's not get stuck. Yeah. You also want to. Well, just... this kind of connects to it, and I I've been thinking about this ever since I started practice, really. Uh, thinking about the, how 
oh, the rashness of my youth and uh, how it eventually brought me to practice. And being a Midwestern boy, I uh, was constantly reminded, you need to be appropriate at certain times. And I realized that one of the things that became important was how to be available to be appropriate. And I've said this before, and I, I keep thinking about it, it's kind of mechanics of my messy mind, you know, but uh, just being uh, available, that's our practice, being available, being here. We're able to see when someone is suffering and able to step in. Uh, and it goes beyond whatever, whatever our momentary desires are at that point. So that's my comment. Yeah, that's right. Well, and you know, that kind of being, mm -hmm. being available is a good way to put that because it, there's some sense of we're getting out of the way. You know, mm -hmm. I did a lot of ceremonies over the last week. <laughs> <laughs> People don't always want to do a lot of ceremonies, a lot of ceremonies and rehearsals and prepping for ceremony, and you just have to say it doesn't matter if I want to do this or not. It's time to sit down and fan sutras for the good of the world. You know, we did one of those big super fanning ceremonies for the ending of COVID and, and people's health, right? It's like, you know, well, it doesn't matter if you want to do that right now. <laughs> you get to sit down. So I think availability is a really good word because it, it feels like opening the hand. It feels like not being stuck, right? Can we be available for what this moment is asking uh, for us? Whatever appropriate is in this moment, whatever right action is in this moment, can we be available for that? I think it's a very helpful approach to practice. So, good. I think uh, Ado had her. Ah, Ado, please. Ado was at the conference with me. She knows where I speak. <laughs> but my response is not about that. Um, right. Uh, I just wanted to share something that Hojasan uh, said to me once, and that was, I was in conflict about my life and practice, seeing them as two different things. And I felt I wasn't available enough to the Sangha because I was so involved in, I worked full time as a physical therapist and I had two ch children at home. And um, now it seems obvious to me, but what he said to me was, well, your Sangha is whoever needs you most. And whoever needs you most right now is your family and your patients. And um, I, I think I already knew that, but I needed somebody to remind me of that. And it really helped me then to start seeing my life as practice and not separate from it. Yep, I remember you telling me that. Thank you for, for sharing that. Uh, it's been very helpful all along. Yeah. The, it's relevant all the time um, to think about who is it who needs me the most. Yes. Um, and, and it's especially helpful when that's coming straight from your teacher. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I you can take to, that as okay because it's coming from straight from your teacher. <laughs> another little thing that this uh, life after death thing makes me think of is that I, I can't remember the details of this, but there's a little story, you know, where the student asked the teacher about that. What can you tell me about life after death or something like that? And the teacher says, I'm more interested in having a good cup of tea. <laughs> I mean, so he wasn't going to speculate about what he didn't know about that. But what was important was right now I'm going to have a good cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Because, like, you know, we don't know and we won't know until we get there. So you might as well have a good cup of tea. That's right. <laughs> good. Thanks. Thanks, Aido. Other things from other folks? It reminded me of a story <clears throat> of a man who went to a Zen master. He said, tell me about death. And the Zen master says, I don't know anything about death. And the person said, well, you're a Zen master, aren't you? Well, yes, but I'm not a dead Zen master. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> don't you, did you have something to say also? Yeah, it was just, I think, it, you know, we could tie a couple of the themes of the discussion <laughs> together. So. Starting with Sawyer's question, um, you know, I think it's it's always, you know, after having done the religious studies thing at IU, I'm always <clears> like thinking more in context of the time because <clears throat> it's sort of unimaginable for us what people's mindset I think would have been like in 1200 in Japan. So we, you know, as modern people have like a totally different way of viewing the world. Um, and one of the things that Dogen says in that passage is, you know, if your mom 
uh, forces you sort of to take care of her, she'll have bad karmic consequences as a result and might be born in a hell realm. You know, so I think it's important to keep in mind that people did sincerely believe these things at the time. Um, and I think that, you know, we wouldn't obviously have that consideration now um, in the same way that it would have been taken quite seriously for people at the time. Um, and likewise, you know, for the practitioner, you know, if the practitioner, you know, loses the sort of good merit of practice to go do something in the secular world, it could be bad for him as well. Right. Um, good point. So that's one thing. The other thing is like, you know, regarding um, rebirth now, um, one of the things that Hojo-san has said that I really like is that, you know, on some level, and it's related too to this like kind of cup of tea idea, is that, you know, we don't have to negate, um, you know, karmic consequences and rebirth in order to uh, you know, act in the same way. Like if, if we act as if rebirth existed, right. we'd be doing good things from a moment by moment right now and, you know, living a good life and practicing appropriately. So in, on some level, it doesn't matter, you know, whether or not rebirth exists. If we behave as if it does, then we're doing the right practice. That's hopeful. I do remember him saying that. Uh, and of course, if we take that approach, then we're doing good again, not because we're going to get something I'm not going to get a good rebirth out of that. I'm not worried about that. I'm doing it because this is what the moment calls for, right? And this is the way we should be, you know, sort of living anyway. So that's a very helpful reminder about even letting go of the, the results of that. Thank you for that. And also, you know, it's important, I think important to keep in mind that, you know, from the early Buddhist perspective, the, the goal ultimately is not to be reborn, you right. know, to totally right. uh, escape uh, rebirth, essentially. So right, right, right. Yep. Level two, yeah. If you're a woman to be reborn as a man, if you're a man to be reborn as a monk, and then if you're a monk to leap off the wheel. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's get on that. All right, other things from other people here or at home? <clears throat> Final comments today on... Um, Will has his hand up. Okay, Will, go ahead. Uh, I just had a, a question. Um, you, you, you brought up uh, the phrase uh, opposites opposite of the three poisonous minds. Hmm. Um, I wonder if you could speak more about that. Um, sure. Yeah, so, uh, you know, if we simply think about what those three poisonous minds are, green anger and ignorance, and we say, what would the opposite of those be? So instead of greed, we have generosity. And instead of anger, we have loving kindness. And instead of ignorance, we have some kind of wisdom or clarity, right? So it's not that there's a hard divide between greed and generosity. It's It's kind of a spectrum, right? It's like it would be very difficult to do something based on pure greed or on pure generosity. But I think the teaching there is how do we turn those things around? If we notice greed, anger, and ignorance arising, how do we turn that around? So if I'm feeling angry towards somebody, do I recognize that? Can I you know, like feel it in the body? Do I know what I'm doing? Am I, can I, for, at first at least, not take action based on that poison such that I perpetuate suffering? So I don't say that unkind thing, or I don't go after somebody, you know, because of my anger. Can I see what's really going on? And in the best of all possible worlds, can I somehow instead cultivate loving kindness? Doesn't mean I condone what the person did, right? Compassion is not condoning. If they're doing something harmful or toxic, doesn't mean I think that's okay, but can I not come back at that person with anger? Right? Can I come back at that person and say, I recognize that you're suffering, that's the basis of this action that you took. You know, uh, I, I wish for you to be free from suffering. And can we do that in a way which is not holier than thou? I recognize that your terrible actions are based on your suffering. And because I'm a pure bodhisattva, you know, I'm going to somehow shower down on you my benevolence. It's like, nee. <laughs> that's all based on ego stuff, right? So when we see the three poisons arising, uh, you know, first, do we see them? Do we, can we not take action based on that? And if possible, can we turn that around? Is that enough on that? Uh, that's the Reader's Digest version. Yeah, yes, that, that's follow great. follow-up there? Yeah, thank you. Okay. You know, anytime we see some harmful something arising, we can think about what would the opposite of that? You know, can I, can I turn that around? There's a powerful energy in those poisons, right? Man, if we're feeling angry, there's some powerful energy there. Can we turn that energy towards something benevolent? Can we turn that energy towards something compassionate and wholesome and skillful? 
And how would it be if we could harness all that energy that comes from ill will and anger and all that stuff and instead turn that into bodhisattva activity in the world? That would be quite something. Other questions, reflections, comments, offerings from anybody this morning? Maybe yeah, I'd like a quick thing about um, Sazen, as it sits between the life and practice thing, mm -hmm. uh, you know, incorporating practice in your day-to-day, you know, -day, whatever you're doing. Mm -hmm. And then the, the thing you said quickly, <clears throat> like in Sazen, you create no karma, right? <laughs> uh, so something I experience also sometimes have is, you know, you're sitting there, your uh, your karma's unfolding, whatever, uh, you're having thoughts about things. It's all kind of laid out, and you'll be able to have like a conviction about it. You'll be able to be like, oh man, I see what's going on, and I need to do something different. And then you do, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, often that's actually more successful than if you just like have that thought when you're just going about your day, right? That has a little more weight to it. But that kind of sounds like it's creating karma, right? It sounds like you're maybe uh, sitting wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it still seems helpful to your practice, seems helpful to your life, too. So uh, I don't know, just if you, if you have any thought on it. Well, sometimes in Zazen we have a certain amount of clarity because we're simply sitting and we're not trying to do something. We're not sitting there trying to solve problems. We're not sitting there trying to psychoanalyze ourselves. Uh, we're just sitting. And sometimes in that just sitting, when the dust settles, you know, we get some clarity and we recognize, oh, I'm doing this thing. And I can see the motivation for it. So, you know, maybe I want to do something different. Now, the challenge is not to sit right there in the middle of the Zazen period trying to follow that or follow the breadcrumbs and solve the problems. So, I'm going to put that over here. You know, it may well be something that when I get up off the cushion, I want to spend some time thinking about or talking with somebody about, or there's some action that I want to take to, you know, remediate something I did. Okay, but that's not now, <laughs> right? So we get that clarity. You know, that clarity is not going anywhere. We don't need to act on do something, stick our heads into it. Uh, but I think it's certainly true that, especially if we're sitting zazen and we notice there's something in my body, I'm feeling tension, I'm feeling anger, I'm feeling sadness, I'm feeling <clears> something. <throat> and I'm speaking now not as a body person. So if I notice it in the body, man, there's something there. Because <laughs> I'm not subtle about the body. Um, you know, it might be. Ah, I see what's going on. I see what's going on. Um, Okay, you know, put it in the back pocket, take the action when you get up. I think there's no question that can happen. But I think our challenge is we get really excited about those insights we have them. Dig into them and like, oh, this is going to solve that problem. It's like, okay, but not now. <laughs> right now, I've, I've committed to sitting here for, you know, however long and just letting things, you know, come and go. Other things from anybody? All right. We have a world peace ceremony to do today, which I think Sagan is going to lead us in. So let's do our closing chant, and uh, we will reset. We'll do some announcements and reset for that. Thanks, everybody, for a good discussion this morning.